So welcome, everybody, to the first episode of the Aaron Novello podcast. This has been something I've been wanting to do for a long time. It's been rattling around in my mind. Got caught up listing lots of homes, coaching lots of clients, going throughout the country, uh, giving seminars, doing uh, prospecting schools. And now I'm so excited to uh, finally come to the platform. And my intention in doing so sincerely is from a place of contribution, right? Really trying to pour out and to share and add as much value as I possibly can. And what we'll be talking about on these uh, episodes are the things that I'm most passionate about. Run is all things sales, right? Sales dialogue, sales scripts, processes, procedures, how to not only have intellectual intelligence, but emotional intelligence, mm-hmm. uh, and how important that is to make meaningful connections with people. The second is, is you know, this idea of scaling, right? Like how to let go of the vine and go from being a operator of your business, which can only function if you're around to being an owner of a business. And that's a transition that, you know, I'm currently uh, going through. And also the third thing that I am super passionate about and love to talk about is finance, right? Personal uh, finance and financial freedom and independence and autonomy, being able to do what I want, when I want, with who I want, how I want. So everybody that I'm going to bring to you guys are hand-picked, hand-selected because they're operating at super high levels, and I feel like they can add tremendous value to you. And that brings us to our first guest on the Aaron Novello podcast, the one and only pride and joy of Oxnard, California, Mr. Jose Luis Morales. How you doing, brother? Uh, Doing excellent, man. Thank you for uh, having me on the show. I'm I'm really excited, uh, and I'm proud to be the first guest, man. That's uh, exciting, man. So I'm I'm glad to help you out with this. My pleasure, brother. And thank for taking the time. I know you're busy. I know you're getting ready to head out and, uh, you know, to a learning event. So I'm curious, um, we've known each other how long now? I'd probably say maybe like six, five to six years. Yeah, five, six years, bro. I watched you grow up, bro. I watched you get Uh, married. I remember being on the phone with you, talking to you about that. And you're like, bro, what should I do, right? Watched you kind of go from, you know, doing good business, like 20 deals a year to not doing great business, 109 deals a year, right? Yeah. And uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be a part of that process and to work with you, you know, in the capacity in terms of, you know, coaching and things of that nature. And the reason why I wanted you to be the first episode, kind of the first guest uh, on this podcast is because I feel like you can add a lot of value as it pertains to the process of listing property in high volume. I know that we worked on that specifically, right, for an extended period of time. So if you could, could you walk people through kind of your experience initially and your kind of approach to listing presentations? And then after we connected and kind of some big ahas and some of the things that we worked on that allowed you to really change that conversion ratio and get it to be much higher. Yeah. So what ended up happening at the beginning is, um, I think like the first year I went on a, uh, like 60 some listing presentations, but I only took like a handful. So it wasn't even like 50% listing presentation ratio. It was probably like 10, 15, 20%. And what was happening is I I didn't have like a direct path and I wasn't being like versus versatile, like at all. Like, like, uh, the way that I was taught to list property was almost like, um, don't walk the property with them around the house because if they walk, if you walk the property with them, they're going to try to sell you and all the features and benefits. But th- th- there was just a lot of rules of what to do, what not to do. And some of them made sense under certain circumstances, but some of them didn't. And I remember like, like, like one time, like this guy, like told me, like, I feel like you don't care. Like, like, like you didn't like, like the other agent was over here telling me how nice my property was. Like you, you didn't even like compliment me on my property, but I was just so in my head. I was so worried about like what to say um, and how to say it and what was right, what was wrong, um, what worked, what didn't work that I wasn't focused on the consumer, bro. And that mm. was like the bottom line. Like I wasn't like really focused on what their goals and their needs were. Therefore, I wasn't able to to service them. And that was a big change, man. So I made changes from uh, dialogue, what I say when I'm there, when they say certain things, what, what I reply back. I made changes from going to paper to going to iPad. 
Um, I went uh, 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 changes from uh, walking the property with them, building a little bit of rapport with them. Um, and essentially, it is uh, my listing presentation now, bro, is 85 to 90 percent. So meaning that I know that if I'm going on a listing presentation, bro, I am taking 85 percent. What that does is it gives you the confidence to talk to more people, bro, and it gives you the confidence to close more aggressively on the phone, bro. Like yeah. literally, bro, when you're closing at 85, 90%, like it gives you the confidence to be like, look, dude, you've got another agent that you're considering. Just give me the opportunity to, to meet with you. That's right. And you know, it's funny you say that because I was on a call uh, setting an appointment this week and the woman was like, hey, you know, I'm just busy. I'm at work. I don't have time. And I was like, you know, I'm really respectful of that. I know we're all time starved in this uh, current slice of time we find ourselves in. At the same time, the truth is we got to make time. I mean, it's costing you $1,000 a month to carry this property. So, I mean, if, if we were to get together under normal conditions, would you usually be available in the evenings or the afternoons? And that turned into evenings and turned into set of the appointments. So what I wrote down here, which I think is awesome, is, is this conscious, purposeful shift where initially you were focused on you. You were worried about what I'm saying. I was using my eyes instead of for what they're for, which is to see. I was more concerned about how I was being perceived. I'm imagining your internal experience was one was fraught with like a little anxiety, like a little worry, right? And because you were so caught up and in your head and focused on yourself, you weren't actually able to focus on the individual. Is that right? Yeah, I was so worried, bro. And you said that, right? I was worried at the listing presentation, bro. I would like... It, I would like spend like, like, let's say I had a listing appointment today at three, I would spend hours, bro, practicing before the, 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 the listing presentation instead of practicing every single day. So I wouldn't have to bump it up three hours before a listing presentation or two hours before a listing presentation. I was so worried about like, oh my God, like, I don't know the neighborhood like that well. And uh, like so worried about all the other comps and knowing everything about their property when the reality is that the process was just a lot simpler, bro. It was more or less like, hey, look, what can we sell the property for? How long is it going to take? And what are you going to do to market and sell my property? And yeah, so um, I just wrote this down, too, which is really interesting. I think would add value is that your tendency in the past is you would be overly focused on like content, like, like what you were saying, which I don't want people to misconstrue. It's very important to know what to say and how to say it. It's critical. Mm -hmm. But it's important to also simultaneously, where I know what to say to such a degree that it becomes the background. And, and that the individuals themselves become the foreground, like their goals and objectives become the foreground. What they're trying to accomplish and why becomes what you're focused on and what your awareness is on. Is that right? That that is correct, bro. And that comes down to practice, bro. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the big things. Like I'll, I'll share with you guys one of the things that I learned specifically from you. Um, you went over this example and you said, "Hey guys, if you're an agent and you practice for thirty minutes a day, let's say five days a week, that's two and a half hours a week, right? Thirty minutes a day, five days a week, that's two and a half hours a week. A month that is ten hours a month." a year that is a 120 hours in a year. Now let's say that another agent practices twice a day. So instead of practicing half an hour a day, he practices for an hour a day. Let's say a week that's five hours a week, um, uh, um, uh, five hours a week, a month that is four hours a month. My math, 25. 25. My, my math is wrong. The yeah, hey, point. but if it was commissions, you count you count that shit just right. Oh, dude, I would be on it, dude. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, essentially, the whole point was like, who do you think is going to be better? Like, like just numbers wise, who do you think is going to be better? The guy that practices for thirty minutes a day, or the guy that practices for an hour a day? So what I did, bro, is I was actually practicing, bro, for an hour and thirty minutes every single day. I remember, bro, I would be in the office. At my old office at Century 21, bro, I would be in the parking lot, bro, with my freaking scripts, bro, printed out, and I would be in the parking lot chanting them, bro, like, when do you plan on moving? How long have you lived at this address? Blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And people would drive by me, bro, and people would look at me, bro, title reps, lenders. They would, be, they would look at me like I was crazy, bro. Like, they would be like, what the hell is this guy doing? This guy... 
they, they would be like, man, this guy just went like to a cult seminar and yeah, basically yeah. got out and is like, 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 like doing that. But, but by practicing more, bro, that became my competitive advantage. And that was one of the other conversations that you had with me. You told me, Jose Luis, like, like, what is your competitive advantage? Like, um, and you told me like, okay, a lot of people, you ask them, what's your competitive advantage? And a lot of people will say, oh, well, I'm honest. Oh, I'm hardworking. Oh, I live in the neighborhood. Oh, I've been selling real estate for 20, 30 years. And you said, well, I want my competitive advantage to be my skill. And I was like, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. He's like, I want to be more skilled in the process of listing and selling property than anybody else in my marketplace. Hence, become the dominant player in my marketplace. So how that now that you decided what your competitive advantage is, is, is how are you going to get there? And the only way you're going to get there is through practice. And I made that the same competitive advantage, bro. In my, in, I decided that makes sense. That makes logical sense to me. I'm going to make my competitive advantage my skills too, because I knew that if I improved my skills, I wouldn't have to worry about what to say anymore. And I could be really focused on the consumer and really help them get what they want in the time that they want, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Now, I'm wondering because, you know, this idea of skill development, right? Like a lot of people, you know, there's various different players out there who provide scripts and stuff. And you were doing that at the same time, you clearly there was a jump. Like you completely altered the way that you were presenting you altered the approach you altered some scripts and dialogues so talk to me about like that process and how before the kind of you know way that you were doing it it was producing outcomes but not nearly the outcomes it's kind of like you had like a like uh you got a bachelor's degree in scripts and then you went and got a doctorate bro so like how did that go how did that talk to me about that so, so early in the process, bro, I was taught that like, you have to follow the script verbatim, like every single word has to be followed. And what I realized is that I wasn't a robot, bro. Like, you know, like, like I wasn't like a robot where it's like, Hey, this exact word. And I, I think a big aha for me was when I started role playing, bro, when people, with people that were producing a lot more than me. So at the beginning of my career, bro. I was role playing with people that were doing three, four, 10 deals a year. Hence, they were all saying the same thing, bro. And because they were all saying the same thing, that's their production was at 10 deals a year because they were all saying the same thing. They were all saying like, I need to think about it. Like, oh, two heads are better than one. Let's think about this together. But the reality is that the, the, what I started doing is I started role playing with people that were better than me. And then I started thinking about this from a consumer's perspective, meaning that like if one of my role play partners said something that like I was like, oh, wow, that sounds really good. If I was the consumer, I would prefer to hear that instead of this. And uh, I started studying that and I started studying that. So my big aha was I started role playing with people that were doing like 60 deals, 100 deals, 150 deals, 200 deals. And then the way I started communicating with people changed because the way that they communicate with people is different than the way that the 10 deal producer communicates with people. They're sure, more, yeah. a lot of them are more consumer centric versus me centric. A lot of them uh, are more like not as robotic as well too. So they're not like, like when do you plan? Like they're, they have more versatility. And I think that was the, the, the big thing. I remember the first time I role played and I'm gonna give him a shout out. Jay Marquez, or Ray Marquez. He's at Ray Marquez. Like, I know Ray. Ray Marquez. He's out of like Northern California. He was the big guy, the first guy that gave me the chance. And I remember I saw him. He was on a panel and I followed up with him, bro. I was like, yo, let's role play. Hey, dude, my schedule's full. Yo, let's role play. My schedule's full. Let's role play. And he gave me the opportunity, bro. I remember I, I jump on a call with him, bro. The first thing he says to me, bro, he goes, Jose, I need to think about it. Doesn't even say hello doesn't say how you doing how was your weekend nothing bro 12 to 15 objections right off the bat bro and i'm like holy shit this is the next level that's what i thought to myself i was like man this is the next level and from that point forward i i made it a purpose um i would uh uh, i would go to a seminar where there's a lot of people uh that uh, that are big producers and 
I would make a hit list, bro, of everybody that I wanted to get on my schedule, bro. And at that seminar, bro, I would make it my point to go up to them and ask them to be on my schedule. And a lot of them would be like, yo, like, uh, let me think about it or not. Let me think about it. Oh, yo, my schedule's full or follow up with me in six months. Yeah. And the ones that would say, hey, uh, yeah, call me during the week. I'm like, well, look, I've got the schedule. I, I, I've got some openings right now. I've got this time or this time. What time would work better for you? And uh, I started making a point to look for skillful role play partners. I sought out the most skilled players in the industry and i made it a purpose to role play and one of them was you bro i prospected you for like years i remember <laughs> you would tell me your schedule was full for like years and then and then finally you gave me the opportunity and now look bro i'm one of your best friends you, yeah. you've got me on your podcast and yeah uh, yeah it's awesome man it's a it's a really uh cool kind of symbiotic uh relationship so it's, it's interesting, this evolution, where first I have to ingrain um, what to say. And that's kind of, again, it's like elementary school. And then if I want to graduate and go higher in those levels, I have to get around people who have a higher skill set. And I see a lot of people get trapped at a certain kind of production level. Part of the reason is, is because precisely that, is that they're only, you know, people have a tendency to want to role play with people that are either at their level or below because uh it feels good right like it it uh strokes the ego it's another thing to get on the phone with somebody that you're actually nervous to get on the phone with and um you know i ask people regularly and i remember when we first started working i'm like hey man how many people in your schedule other than me do you have that when you get on the phone you're like yo i need, i really need to bring it like i need to be on point mm -hmm. and the more people that you can have in your schedule like that really the better now I'm curious because you mentioned that you went from kind of a about 50% kind of uh, conversion ratio on listing appointments to now upwards of 80. What do you attribute that to like specifically, right? Because I want to give people some very kind of uh, tangible, not just like, you know, conceptual, but very tangible things that they could be doing to try to raise that conversion rate. So I, 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 I think I did two things, bro, on the listing presentation. One, I, I, I started presenting the plan of action because I found out that a lot of people in my market were fluffing the presentation up and saying what they were going to do to market the property. And then two, I started mastering certain objections. Number one is I've got, I, I, I've got another agent that I'm interviewing. And number two is I need to think about it at the listing presentation. Oh, three things, three things, three things. Uh, I changed the way I present the price. So uh, I made it more about them and strategy and giving them the option to select a, a price. I mastered, hey, I need to Wait, think wait, about time it. out, because that's good. Because I'm aware of, that's huge, right? Yeah. So, so in the past, the, your kind of previous training prior to us connecting was like, it's this way or no way. Yeah, and, and that was <laughs> dumb because... <laughs> I saw you hesitate, but it just is. It's dumb, bro. I missed out on a lot of money, bro. Uh, the reality is that I, I left a lot of money on the table because of the way that I was presenting price. I remember like one specifically, it was like December, bro. I worked so hard, bro, to get this appointment. It was like a six, seven hundred thousand dollar property in Newberry Park, bro. And it was like it, it, I they wanted to list it at six sixty five, bro. And I, I, I was like, look, the, the price is six fifty, And then they, they basically gave me the, I need to think about it. But the reality was that they needed a, they didn't like the price that I was sure. pitching to them. That was the reality. And they ended up listing at six sixty five, bro. The agent that listed at six sixty five ended up reducing it to six fifty, and it sold at six fifty. But I was just like, oh my God, dude. Like it was like, it's, they were extremely motivated, bro. The guy reduced the price within two weeks, bro. The property sold within three weeks. And I was just like, man, these people like were ready to sign up. with Yeah. Me, bro. And it's so interesting. So like this, uh, you know, Jim Rohn lets us know that success is a, a few disciplines practice every day mm -hmm. and that the opposite of success. So not producing the outcomes that you want are a few errors in judgment mm -hmm. practice regularly. Mm hmm. So this idea of the need to be right and being attached to the need to be right was an error in judgment. And then with some small little tweaks, so we start working together and I'm like, Jose, man, like when they say that, 
And it's like, sure, I mean, that's an option. We can certainly do that. I guess here's my question is if we can come to an agreement with regards to how to position the property price wise, do you think there'd be any other reason why we couldn't get started today? Just yeah. one question, man. One little thing, one little set aside. And them saying, well, no, I don't think so. Great. So let me ask you this. If, let's say we start at that 665, if we see that the marketplace isn't responding in a few weeks at that point, do you think you'd be prepared to make an adjustment? Well, yeah, I think we would. Well, great. And it sounds like you feel comfortable, confident with me that I can help you get the job done. Is that right? Well, yeah, we do. Awesome. So may I make a suggestion? And they say, sure. Let's go ahead and take care of the paperwork at 665. We'll monitor the situation closely. If we see the marketplace doesn't respond, then we'll make the appropriate adjustment. And that one skill set, that's a mental map first, a way of thinking about something, which is what, you know, proximity is power. Getting proximity to somebody, usually when we're stuck, we're one relationship away from something. Mm -hmm. I'm one person away who needs to point out to me what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, teach me a new skill, right? So you were going and you had the hustle, bro. You're pound. I'm sure you fought Dude. tooth and nail to get that appointment just to get in the door. And one error in judgment, like one just mental map that was just off, right? Just off. It prevented you from making 15, 16, 17, 18,000 bucks. Bro, there was a couple like little shifts, bro, that like helped me like make like like go from like 500 to over seven figures, bro. Yeah. And the that was one of them the pricing like actually going over the, the plan of action and then while prospecting bro i've already got another agent that was a huge one bro like like i tell people like like look at your market bro and what objection do you hear the most yeah and more than likely if you're in california it's going to be i've already got another agent bro because yeah. there's so many other agents bro as soon as i learn how to handle that bro it was like, oh my God, bro, appointment, appointment. And these are motivated appointments, bro. Because yeah, yeah, tell yeah. You, I've already got another agent. They're basically telling you, I'm going I'm to list my, my property. property. <laughs> I'm going to be listing my property. I just already have somebody that's going to be doing it for me, you know? Yeah. But like, if you learn how to convert those, it's like, boom. Like, um, like it takes your contact to appointment down a lot lower, you know? Well, that, that, when I started, is it magnifies like you're saying. So like for each and every one of those times when somebody says it, where in the past you just shut down. Now, again, one little, one little thing, right? You know, it's interesting because I do these talks and people come up to me like, oh man, like I'd love to work with you or whatever. And I'm like, cool. And sometimes we let them know, you know, what's involved with that in terms of an expense. And they're like, oh man, that's kind of a lot. And like, think about it, like one little mental map, like one little shift in approach, one little kind of word or sentence you can say. And it makes all the difference in the world. You go from every time somebody says, I want to think about it to shutting down to now having a way to convert. Or you go from, I already have an agent. You say, well, I appreciate that. I know that's a business decision. You want to make sure you're making the best decision possible. And as such, usually makes sense to get more than one opinion just to make sure you're making the best choice. I guess I'm curious. And then I move on and then we can set an appointment and then couple that with being more efficient on the listing presentation. Now we get that magnified growth. Now we go from 20 deals to 100 deals. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that 100% a hundred, a hundred percent, bro. There's no doubt about it that I would agree with that. That's awesome, man. So I guess I'm wondering for you now, because we've been working together for a while, like we still kind of role play and work on scripts and dialogues, like as far as communication and as far as, um, you know, connecting with people, in a meaningful way, like what are you currently working on now to continue to hone and refine that skill? I'd probably say price reductions, bro. Um, that's the skill that I, that I'm that I'm that I'm working on. Um, I, I I would say I'm pretty good at price. I, I, I price property pretty well. But uh, what I've learned uh, in working together is sometimes you have to anticipate things before they actually happen, and you have to prepare for things before you actually need them. You know. Yeah. So hey, like, do you remember um, that call one time we were on a call? I was like, Jose, you have a really good brain. Use it. Use it. And uh, you're like, huh? <laughs> uh, well, you have to anticipate things before they actually happen. Like, like the market may not always be as hot at it as it is right now, you know? Um, it may not always be as active. At least in my market, I'm getting multiple offers again, but I know that doesn't last forever, you know? Nothing lasts forever. So essentially what I try to do is I try to work on things that are going to help me. And, and price reductions is a money-making skill, meaning that like 
essentially if getting a price reduction helps properties that aren't moving sell hence helps them get what they want and it helps us sell the property so essentially it's it's something that i'm not 100 percent comfortable with 100 percent, and something that i've sought out like some of the best people like there's this guy named matt green in philly you know matt he's skilled uh, no. well it's good that it happened on the first one you know it's good you to have like freaking Grant Cardone on here or something like that. You uh, know? Yeah. <laughs> goes, Sorry, Grant. My bad. Uh, for sure, man. I mean, that's how it is, right? And it's yeah. it's cool because like I'm aware that a lot, you know, those thoughts like end up stopping a lot of people from like actually doing something or getting started. Yeah. Like what happens if this happens or whatever. And um, it's going to happen. But right. you just kind of push through it and you make the best of it. So I was prior to kind of power going out, we were talking about you know, what are you currently working on to continue to hone and refine that skill? And you mentioned kind of price adjustments that you feel really comfortable with the listing presentation. Now you feel really comfortable with, um, presenting price now, right. With those little tweaks, little changes in mental maps and little changes in dialogue. So talk to yeah. us about like, are you trying, what are you working on specifically around adjustments and what internally, cause I know because we talk about it, but what internally have you had to overcome around that conversation? Well, I, I think the main thing, bro, is kind of just realizing that, like, I put a lot of pressure on myself when I take a listing to get it sold, bro. I, I do that. And the thing is that I'm not responsible for the price, you know. The marketplace is. But sometimes, like, um, and even now, I'll be candid, bro. I get like when a property's not selling, bro, I'll be like, what the hell is going on? Like, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'll start to get like internal, like tens. And um, it's a lot of pressure sometimes. So and talk to me about, about that convert because I'm aware we specifically had a conversation about that. Yeah. So talk to me about that. Like what, like, because remember, we, it starts with like a mental map. It starts with a mindset. It starts with like a belief. It starts with something going on in here. And I remember we were in the middle of role playing a price adjustment and I stopped you and specifically we had this conversation. So talk to me about that kind of breakthrough for you. So I, 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 I'd say that um, part of it is knowing how to say it and what to say it. But the other part of it is just understanding that um, that the marketplace is fluid. The marketplace is always changing. There's always new properties coming on the market. There's always properties not, uh, there's always properties that are, that are selling. Every property is completely different. And the really, really the only way to find out what something is worth is not what the neighbor's property sold for is, is how the marketplace responds to this property specifically, because they're, they're, they're all a bit different. So, I would say I'm still working on it, bro. It's something that I'm still not 100% comfortable with it. Um, I'd love for all of my listings to sell in seven days, bro, and just be done with it. But it, unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. Um, and then different people have different levels of motivation, you know, like different clients have different levels of motivation. Some clients, I mean, want to sell it like one week and some clients I um, uh, want to, uh, are okay with it being on the market for a little bit longer. The, the other thing is that being okay when something is not working out and whenever the client starts, um, like, because sometimes when a property is not selling, the client will start pointing fingers. And It'll who do they point it at? And they point it at the agent, bro. They yeah, now I'm wondering, because your natural disposition, right? People see you like the great, powerful, dynamic Mr. Jose Luis Morales, which you are all of those things. I'm aware mm -hmm. you really care, man. And I your natural it. disposition is you would take it personal and it would stress you out, bro. Like you like, I remember you telling me you're like, dude, like I lose sleep. Like I don't want to call these people because it would make you feel bad. Like you thought you were doing something wrong. Yeah. And, and essentially, um, one of the things that I had to learn was like, whenever a relationship starts going like that and, and, and then you've done everything that you can being straight up with them and saying, Hey, look, if you feel that I'm not doing the right things, or if you feel that I'm not the right agent for you, I'm happy to, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm willing to release you from the contract, no cost, no nothing, just let you go and being okay with that. And I had to do that twice last year, bro. I had to do that twice, but these clients were just like, like literally like dude, like, like pointing like fingers, like being aggressive. And I didn't enjoy it. 
And like before it would be like, oh, how are you going to let go of somebody like $15,000, $20,000? It's not worth it, bro. It was not worth it. Like for me, it, it wasn't worth it. The interesting thing is both properties haven't sold. Like, like haven't sold. They relisted with other agents. Both properties have not sold. Um, and it just wasn't worth it for me, bro. Was not worth it for me. Like as soon as they, they start doing that, like I don't want to lose sleep about it. Like one of the things that I, I started like changing is I'm more selective as who I take on as clients now as well too um so i'm not looking to take on everybody as a client bro because there are some clients that like I, they will make your life i'm looking to work with good people bro like i'm looking to work with good people that are just good human beings who respect what you do like they see value in you like right yeah and and, and unfortunately there are people out there that don't see value out there that don't treat you right that point fingers that insult you that uh send you like mean email messages and stuff like that and I'm, I'm just not at that point in my career where um i have to do that anymore you know like like i don't have to and, and that's the benefit of working your butt off like one of the benefits of working your butt off and like actually spending the time is that you can get to a place where you can be a little bit more selective, you know, where you, you have put yourself and your family financially, where you're not relying on that paycheck to pay your mortgage bills, or you're not relying on that paycheck to feed your son or whatever, you know? So it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's a benefit. Which is of, interesting because what I'm aware of, and this is kind of at that advanced, you know, kind of PhD level is that if I'm, if I'm attached at all, I really can't serve you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if I'm attached in some way about like offending you, if I tell you the truth or attached to a particular outcome, I can't authentically really serve you and do what's in your best interest. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and, and, and it happens. I mean, where people are attached and I, I think one of the worst things that like happens to agents as well too, is because. Uh, let's say that you only produce three to four deals, but obviously you've got personal expenses. You're so a lot of times like, like at my old company at century 21, my broker, literally the day that it would close, the agents would be there. Yeah. Like knocking on the door. Camarillo, like where's the money, bro? Let's go. Right from Camarillo, bro. If they lived in thousand Oaks, he'd drive to thousand Oaks to the property to pick up their paycheck because they were living paycheck to paycheck, paycheck and they needed that money right then and there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember having a, a, a conversation with my broker and my broker's like, how many checks do you have that you haven't deposited? I'm like, uh, X amount. I told him the amount that I had. And he goes, dude, you need a cash room because last time, last time I thought I had all this money in my bank account and then freaking you were just holding <laughs> on to like 10 checks that you didn't do it. But I think that it, like if you're able to, to like get to the point where you're not living paycheck to paycheck, it makes the conversation with the customer a lot better too, because you're able to give them better advice. Correct. You're able to not be attached to it. So I'm not talking, I'm, I'm, the reason I was having this conversation is not to be like, oh man, like there's this money in the bank account. It's basically to, to, to understand that you want to get out of that position where you're living paycheck to paycheck because you're able to focus more on the consumer and you're able to tell clients like, like, Hey, look, this isn't in your best interest. Hey, it may not be in your best interest to do this or that. Or have you thought about, I remember one time this guy wanted to sell and he didn't take into account that the, 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 that there was going to be taxes involved in the sale. And I told him, Hey, look, did you take this into consideration? He goes, I didn't. And then once he factored that in, it didn't make sense for him to sell. Three years later, bro, he calls me. Hey, dude, I'm ready to sell. Of course. You were, you were up front. You were honest with me. Most agents, because they're so attached to that check, yes. wouldn't be able to tell the client that. Hence, the client would be in an escrow, have to pay capital gains. Now, the client burned that relationship with that client, which could lead to better, better relationships. So it comes down to doing the right thing for the client as well, too. You know, If you're always focused on doing the right thing for the client um, instead of yourself, it's going to it's going to produce better outcomes over the long run versus the short run, you know? Mm -hmm. Like looking at this from a long-term perspective a lot of times, not from a short-term perspective. Like a lot of times people want to take the shortcut. 
And I, I, I think that when you take the shortcut, you're like, yeah, you may experience like an instant boost or instant success, but over the long run, it ends up hurting you tremendously, you know? Mm -hmm. There is yeah. no shortcuts, by the way, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, I remember- There isn't a magic the, formula either. There's not, <laughs> the man. There's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if people saw that on my Instagram. I was doing this talk and uh, somebody's like, where do you get your list of people to call? And I was like, well, underneath that question is you're imagining that I have a magic list. That there's like somewhere at the end of the rainbow, like I knock on a door, a little midget comes out, hands me a magic list. I give him the password, right? And the truth is there is no magic list and there is no shortcuts. I remember at the beginning of my career, I would go into my office and there was an elevator and um, I purposely wouldn't take the elevator and I would take the stairs. And what I would say out loud, people might've thought I was crazy, but what I would say out loud to myself as I was going up the stairs is there's no shortcuts to success. And the great news is, is I've stopped looking for them. You see, because people can spend a whole lifetime looking for shortcuts, trying to find the magic answer, the magic pill, the quick way to make a quick buck. But like you're saying, over the long term, that leads to more of the same. Yeah. Right? It's not something that you're actually going to ultimately get ahead with. So you touched on something which is interesting, and then I'll let you go because I know you're a busy dude, Mr. Jose <laughs> Luis Morales, is this idea of, all right, so... I got to learn how to sell because the money's not in the service, it's in the selling of the service. Mm -hmm. I got to get an advanced education on selling and be willing to pay for it, right? Mm -hmm. I have to understand the process underneath, right? So I can be really good at helping people to come to kind of conclusions and make decisions. Mm -hmm. I have to be good at presenting things in a way that comes from a place of contribution, right? Not trying to take, right? Just trying to serve. And when I help people get what they want, I can get what I want, right? And then you also mentioned something which is really interesting that on top of that, because I know you took an interesting path and it's one similar to me and what I've taken is at the beginning, man, like you lived with your parents for a while, for like years, bro, years. And I remember we had a conversation one time and, and, you, and it, you, you just kind of let it slip. And I was like, you still live with your parents, bro? And you were like, yeah. And I was like, well, tell me a little bit more about that. I stayed in curiosity instead of judgment. And you were like, well, yeah, I've been living with my parents. I've been saving money and I've been buying property. So... Talk a little bit about that. Talk about how that has kind of helped you in terms of what you just mentioned, right? About being unattached to outcomes because you had expenses manageable. And then you started to create, you know, convert linear income, which is earned income into residual income that comes on a regular basis. Yeah. So essentially I got in in the market in 2010. And at that time, bro, I saw a lot of people that were really successful working at Home Depot, bro, that were really successful real estate agents working at Home Depot, Walmart, like basically they over leveraged themselves. So I got to see all the pain without having to experience it, bro, mm. so, which was great, man. It was like the perfect time for me to get into the market because it made me aware that that stuff doesn't always go up and, and things change and that, like, like there's contractors, bro, that I, that, that, that I used to deal with back in the day, bro, that I try calling them now. They're like, dude, I'm just too busy. I can't help you. And I'm just like, dude, like 10 years ago, bro, you were fucking begging me for business, you know, yeah. like 10 years ago. Do you not remember that? And like, I see people like over leveraging themselves and doing that kind of stuff. So what, 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 what I made a commitment from the beginning is I never want to put my family through that, bro. I never want to experience it personally. And I never want to do it myself. So I made a commitment uh, that I would uh, build enough residual income to pay for all my personal expenses. So, yes, I was living at my parents for two, three years. But at the same time, bro, I was buying properties. I bought I, I, I bought uh, when I moved into my personal residence, I had three rental properties that paid me about five thousand dollars a month or something like that, bro. So like my mortgage was thirty three hundred at that time. but my residual was 5,000. So essentially the residual paid for my mortgage. So it gave me uh, the ability to take bigger, not bigger risk in my business, but to invest more money into my business because I didn't have this huge overhead. So I had li I lived very, like I would, I would say below my means for a long time. Like, like I lived. And you still do. I still do. I still live way below my means. 
But I do that on purpose, bro, because um, A, I don't ever want to be in a position where my family is struggling for money or I can't make the bills because, I mean, I, I mean, somebody can like, I mean, somebody can like disrupt your business with technology one day and you could be out of business. I mean, there's so many things that could happen, uh, especially nowadays that, that could affect, uh, affect us. So I made that decision. Not only that, but that helped me take like, uh, like I remember like when I had my first two rental properties, those two properties were producing like $3,500 a month or something like that. And that allowed me to take the leap to get an assistant before I actually needed one. Like I was like maybe like 30, 20 some deals a year and people say, Oh, don't get one till you're like 30, 40. But that allowed me to, to grow my business. So the living substantially below your means allowed me to invest back into my business and to be able to not be worried about making ends meet. Uh, essentially, and I still do it. I mean, we bought a 25 unit this year, man, or last yeah, year. Yeah, buddy. Big, we took down a big complex, you know? So, like, I'm still doing it. And, like, the goal for this year is to add 36 units uh, to the real estate portfolio, you know? So, um, yeah, we're still doing it. Um, my goal is to get my freedom back. I mean, I like, I want to be at a point where all my business and personal expenses are taken care of by residual property. Um, and, and I, I play like, uh, like, like before I add like liabilities, I focus on adding assets. So like, mm -hmm. uh, the, like when I hired my first assistant, that was an expense. I wouldn't call it a liability, but I call it an investment. That was like maybe like $2,500 a month at that time. I had three thirty five hundred in residual. So before I bought my house, I bought another rental. So it's always like this game of like, okay, like, Instead of like, hey, I want this nicer car, I'm just going to sign up for it. I think like, okay, how can I get a property or how can I invest my money where it produces that amount of income on a monthly basis to be able to pay for that versus versus going out like uh, it's like delayed gratification versus going out and actually like uh, like if I want like a, a new car or a new house, I'm going to try to find a way for my assets to pay for that versus signing up for that and then kind of trying to figure it out. So that's kind of been my, my strategy. Um, and uh, uh, the whole thing is that it gets to a point where I'll share this with people. Like I know an investor that makes about a, a, a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars a month in just residual income. And this guy is a well-known person in our town and owns a tons of property. And it gets to the point where you have so much residual coming in that it becomes a lot easier. If you simplify things, this guy can buy a property every four months cash, which that means that he's adding an additional $2,300 a month, $30,000 a year, every, every four months. So it gets to the point where he's adding like an extra 30 a year. And then it, it just snowballs like crazy once yes. it gets to a certain point. But the hard part is getting up there. But once, if you maintain your expenses reasonable once it starts to snowball then it becomes like oh man like you've got like so, residual to buy like more property yeah so what's so interesting about that like what i wrote down is just it's prioritizing freedom and what i'm aware of is you know we get all these messages about success and what it's supposed to look like and it's supposed to look like fancy cars and watches and things like that and trips and you know instagram life that we live in now and agents typically have a tendency to fall into uh, the same traps that other people do who earn high incomes. Um, it's amazing to me that, you know, when you really get down to it, a lot of people who make a lot of money typically don't have too much. They're either living in it, driving it, or wearing it. And those three things are, I mean, it's kind of silly, right? The end game, real businesses are in businesses to make profit. I mean, that's what they do. And what they do with profit, profit is they reinvest it, right? So you know, this, you've prioritized freedom. I mean, you got nice stuff, but like you prioritize freedom. You spend the majority of excess capital on asset accumulation. If you're going to raise lifestyle, you do so by buying an asset that throws off the cash in order to purchase whatever it is that you want. So, you know, like our boy, uncle G says, if I'm, if I'm going to do something stupid, if I'm going to buy something silly, like the watch or the car or this, I want it to be out of residual, not out of earned. Yeah. 
And that requires mm -hmm. discipline, right? So it's interesting. You use this vehicle of residential resale brokerage. You use the skill, right, to produce income. And then we take that income and, and we convert it into residual. And that's just the game we play, guys. That's how it's done. But first, I got to... I got to have the skills, man. I got to know what to say and how to say it. That's where it begins. So listen, brother, I appreciate you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to be with me today. Uh, your time is super valuable. I think people are going to get a lot of value from this. And uh, you're awesome, man. So so where can people find you if they want to check you out? So on Instagram, um, uh, Jose Luis Morales. The only thing is that Luis is with a Z. Yeah. So Jose Luis Z Morales. Awesome, man. And if you got any, uh, you know, referrals you need to send to Oxnard, Luis is your boy. Mr. Uh, Jose Luis Morales. So, that, hey, man, I appreciate you. Have uh, an awesome trip, and I look forward to connecting with you soon, probably next awesome. week at some point. Awesome. Thank you, my man. Great talking to you. Bye -bye. My pleasure. Bye-bye.